welcome to the One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sallenberger. On today's podcast, I chat with Derek Scott about having fun with stuck points. Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the Enneagram series. I had so much fun doing that with Joan and Joan and I are super excited about our upcoming course in March. It's filling up quickly. So if you're interested, then shoot me or Joan an email or go to our websites and check that out. I'm so excited to chat with Derek. I think this might be our fourth episode that we did together. And what's super exciting about this episode is you can actually see the video version um, on his YouTube channel. So if you don't know about Derek, Derek has a zillion videos on his YouTube channel that he's been doing for a really long time. And it has helped me and I know a lot of other people learn about the model, learn about their own systems, do some work. There's a video actually of Derek and I doing a session where he's a therapist and I'm the client. And we do a full full session. Um, I think I think we even do an unburdening. Um, and then there's a video of this episode. So if you've always wanted to know what the behind the scenes look like and all the facial expressions that I use and all the nonverbals, um, it's super fun. And so Derek put that up on his website. Um, so the link to that is in the show notes. Um, also, we recorded this about a month or so ago. So the masterclass he mentions with Liz Phillips um, is happening the same day that this podcast is released. So if you want a recording of the podcast, um, you can go to his website under the IFS Masterclass um, section and you can get a recording of the um, the workshop that Liz is doing. Liz also did a podcast with me um, a year or two ago, so you could check that out too. If you're curious about the update with the One Inside 30 Days to Your Authentic Self book, the book will be available on Amazon in April. You can pre-order it on Amazon, um, which would be great and helps me out a lot to get those pre-orders. I also have a few copies left in my kitchen. I got a bunch and I sold all those out. And so I had to request more. There was so I sold out for a little while, but I have more. So if you want some more, and if you cannot wait until April and you want me to mail one directly from me to you, I'm happy to do that. You can go to my website, TammySallenberger.com. I called this episode having fun with stuck points because Derek and I just are friends and we've gotten to know each other through the years and we just have a good time with this episode. And I also thought this was a great episode to put right after the Enneagram because it gets us back into full IFS, full working with our systems. This episode is not just for practitioners and therapists of the model. I think it's really helpful for anybody that feels stuck with their own systems. Enjoy. So Derek, it's so good to be with you. Mm -hmm. Enjoy hanging out with you so much. And um, we have been talking about um, meeting again to talk about where our therapist parts get stuck in the model. Yeah. And so um, I'm curious what you're seeing and the students you have in yourself or sort of what you're hearing in with your people in your, in your school and all the stuff that you do, like where, where are you hearing people get stuck? And I'm also realizing that I'm just jumping in and I'm not saying like, Hey, how's it going? So maybe we uh, should start with like, Hey, how's it going? It's going great. Let's jump in. Let's go. Let's, Let's do go. it. So I'll, tell you, so I'll tell you what, in my stepping stone training and in the Adler uh, program that I teach, uh, those, the same questions come up again and again in the consult groups or they come up when people are in their practice groups. So I wanted to um, just address some of them because they, they seem very common, right? Um, so I'll let you know what we're going to talk about because if people want to stop listening now, they can if it's not relevant, <laughs> right? But we've got, you know, what, what often comes up is what do I do if a client says there's no self? Or what if they say, you know, I don't know? Or, you know, what if they say, well, I go inside and there's nothing there? Or how do we transition to this model or introduce this model. So those are the four that I'm going to speak to. There's, of course, many, many more, but they're very common, right? So. Yeah, and I want people just to notice the parts of them that um, that want to stop listening. <laughs> and just honor okay. those parts that want to stop listening and ask them for space. <laughs> That's so cool. All right. So All right, here we go. What's the first one? All right. So my students say to me, what, what do we do if someone says there's no self, 
Right. So my first question back is, why are you trying to convince them they have a self? Hmm. Right. So I, and it's usually a really well-intentioned part that here's someone presenting with, you know, a lifetime's worth of a blended low self-esteem part or, you know, or a part of, so I've done horrible things, I'm a horrible person. And that can trigger one of our you know, caretaker parts, right? It's like, no, you know what, at your core, you've got this compassionate, clear, kind, and then you're in the parts war. Yeah, well, and you're also oh. in it like a teaching, a teaching part too. Yeah, so, you know, check out your teaching part or your caregiving part or whatever it is that now gets into a parts war with the client. And why? Why do you, you know, have a need to tell them they have a self when you can just illustrate it, right? You can say things like, um, well, you know, do you ever get curious about why you do stuff? Do you ever get curious about why other people do stuff? Right? You don't have to name that as self. Everybody has curiosity, right? And they can name that. I love that. Um, yeah, one, one thing I like to say uh, to people, well, usually when I'm teaching, I don't know if I'd say this to a client, but you might, right? Is I'd say, um, imagine wherever you are right now, you tell me you can do this, right? You leave your house, you know, you step out onto the street, you look down the street and you notice there's a little kid that's sitting there by themselves, maybe six, seven years old, right? And they're crying. So you look around, there's no other adults around, there's no other kids around, right? What's your impulse? to pull over and get out of the car and see what's going on with this kid. Yeah, and how are you going to do that? So you pull over, you get out of the car, you approach the kid. What are you going to do? Yeah, all my, all my mom parts are like, I almost feel like a little bit of a buzzing energy. Like my mom parts are like, oh my gosh, what's going on with this kid? How is he doing? Yeah, I'm going to get out and say like, hey buddy, how's it going? I might sit down next to him and just kind of be, cal- be as calm as I can be. I'm not going to be like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Right. And I'm going to be calm and I'm going to be like, how's it going, buddy? What's going on? Okay, so I would suggest, Tammy, that what's informing your impulse there is your calmness, your curiosity, right. your compassion, your self-leadership. That's all we're talking about, right? Now, it's funny. I posted this on one of the IFS Facebook pages and people were like, well, that could be a caregiver. That could be a parenting part. It doesn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. It's about that. Is there enough self-energy here, right? So that's the impulse. You see a vulnerable being. Right? And you are moved, right, to to help it out in some way. That's all. That's I love what we're that. talking. About. I love that. Yeah, it's very easy. Well, and I love that too, Derek, because I think sometimes we think that in the terms of like all self, it has to be like all self. And if there's a mothering part, you know, the sort of, I have a lot of mothering parts or like my mothering part, I think is kind of big. And so I feel like sometimes when there is this mothering energy, I'm like, oh, nope, that's a mothering part. I got to get that mothering part to step back so self can be here. So that's, I think that's really good information about like, we can just have, it doesn't have to be either or. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, it could be many parts have a lot of self energy. And, and that, you know, that helps people to notice, oh, I would do that. I would take care of that kid, right? You know, so what does that say about you when your inner critics telling you, you know, you're terrible human being and blah, 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 right? So, (laughs) um, but there's, there's another piece there, though, I just want to be clear on. When we're working therapeutically, Uh, and that caregiving part comes up with tons of self-energy, we may need to ask it to soften back because here's the example I usually give when I'm teaching. Let's say a part is presenting. It's a 10-year-old boy. He's in a cave. He's freezing. He's naked. He's got um, gray circles under his eyes, and he's frightened, and the cave is damp. Let's say you get that kind of presentation. Well, most of us, I would guess, would have a caregiver part that would want to come in and throw a blanket around the kid, right? Of course. Mm-hmm. Right? So then if it's hard for the caregiving part to witness that, we ask it to self and back because if self is available to it, or more self energy is available to witness that without moving to fix it or change it, but to fully witness, there may be more information like he's needing a broken glass. So the level of distress really needs to be witnessed. And it's hard for caregiving parts, which is why we ask them to self and back. It also leads to burnout, right? We've talked about that before, about like the more we have caregiving parts, the more it leads to burnout and self isn't going to get burned out. Yeah. Then the other piece you said around, you know, people use this language of in self or not in self. If you're in self, you're the Buddha or the Christ avatar. So, I mean, that's a high bar. (laughs) So my experience is- I mean, for some people. Yeah. You know, for those not as enlightened as you, Tammy, but, you know, (laughs) the- the, uh, the notion of, yeah, I've got enough self-energy to be present to you in the way you need. And I've got parts nattering on in the background about how terrible your hair looks or what I'm going to have for lunch. As long as they're way, way back, I could be present. Right? <laughs> so, 
By the way, listeners, her hair looks fabulous. Just saying. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. As does yours. Why I used to. So thanks for that. <laughs> so that's what it is. No self, right now. Let's move on to the client that says, you know, I don't know. And I, this was a really good learning piece for me. So I'll share it with you. I had a client, client that I would get increasingly, my frustrated part would come up because I'd say to her, um, you know, uh, that part we were looking at last time, right? Would it be okay to go back to that one? Oh, I don't know. I'd say, okay, well, you were talking about moving to the States from Canada and uh, the impact that might have on, on your family, right? Should we look at those parts? Yeah, I don't know. So I go, okay, well, um, you, how about your dog, right? Because you were talking about the, you know, you love your dog, right? And it was needing to, to readjust to a different country. Right? Could be focusing on that. Yeah, I don't know. Drove me nuts, right? So my frustrated part would come up. I took it to peer supervision and I got clarity, right? Obviously it's a protector. So when that comes up for folks now, here's what I offer them, right? You know what? It makes sense to me that it might've been necessary back in the day to not know. Mm. And so here's the example. You're one of three kids. You've got a, a parent who's prone to violence, right? You're in the kitchen and you break a plate. The parent comes in, right? Who broke this? If I say I did, I'm going to get a thrashing. If I say, I don't know, I've got a one in three chance <laughs> of getting yeah. a passion, right? Yeah, so I could see how it's not safe to know, right? And how I don't know. So I'm, so when I got that clarity, the next session I worked with this client, I said, I said all of that, you know, it makes sense to me how it might not have been safe to know at some point in your life. How is it to hear that? Guess what she said? Do you want me to, you want me to say? I, I'm yeah. guessing it had to be shocking I, I think it was probably true for her, but also shocking. Yeah, that would have been lovely. In fact, she said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, she didn't. No, she she didn't. <laughs> but the difference was I wasn't triggered, right? So I was able wow. to say, here it is again. Wow, yeah. that's a great protector you've got. Yeah. Right? And yeah. then every time it came up, I'd say, well, let's welcome this one again, right? Here it comes it. again. Wasn't triggered. Yeah, it's amazing. What's amazing about that is like re you weren't triggered, right? Like you weren't triggered. You could bring more self energy there. And even if she says, I don't know, because that's the part that's present right there, right? Like that's the present. That's the part that's in the room. The part that's in the room is the I don't know part. So that's who you're talking to. Right. So, of course, it's going to say, I don't know to that. But then late, maybe later when that part feels a little bit safer and it can soften back, another part can come in and be like, wait a minute. Derek said this thing and that's actually good information or that might yeah. there might be some truth to that yeah that's right because behind whatever's presenting there's always parts hearing stuff right yeah yeah now the other I don't know that, that I noticed coming up is when you when we ask someone to go inside we ask them to connect with parts right I don't know how to do that yes yeah so I'll hear that once and I'll say something like um I don't know why this intervention works Tammy but it, it usually does I'll say, you know that feeling when you're in a restaurant and you think someone's staring at you and you turn around and they are? And most people have had that experience. And so I'll say, well, it's kind of like that. And they say, oh, okay. And then they do it. I have no idea why that works, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. But if it doesn't, then bear in mind, but right, here's what may be going on in the client that they're not necessarily telling you about. Uh, if you're my therapist, right? You, Tammy, think I'm crazy. You think I've got little people inside me. <laughs> Um, years ago, I watched a movie called Sybil, and that was a crazy person, right? And so I don't want to be a crazy person. So you can suggest all of that back. Is there something going on like that? Because then you can track crazy. What's the worry about being crazy? You can also name, you know, every IFS therapist and practitioner has transitioned from believing this is me to, oh, I've got all these parts. So how did you make that transition? Mm, right? you, yeah, if you good. share that with your client, yeah, it normalizes and then, and um, helps them with that, right? And then I'll just share this with you. So <laughs> when I was learning the model, I was in my sauna, which is where I you know, work with my part. It's a nice altered state. And um, there was this part worried that I was going crazy. What it actually said was, you're never gonna get a date now. Not only do you have all these other things, but now you talk to little people inside you. You know, they'll think mm -hmm. you're crazy. I said, okay, what's the worry about being crazy? Where it took me, was my mother was a psychiatric nurse and it was, believe it or not, take your kid to work day. <laughs> so, so I'm in this psych unit of a hospital. I'm 10, 10 year old part. 
My mom says, go and play with Lottie. She likes to play with the blocks, putting them into, into the shape, right? Uh-huh. You know, that, it's good. So here's Lottie, this enormous woman in a muumuu, drooling, putting, you know, triangles into circles, right? But she couldn't do it. So I'm like, oh, hi, Lottie. You know, we could, I was a good kid, right? We could play in this way. Anyway, Lottie got frustrated because she couldn't get the triangle into the circle and she started beating it with her fist. And then Lottie got dragged away by two orderlies, screaming and spitting and drooling all over her muumuu. And my 10-year-old part was just staring at her going, yeah, I guess that's a crazy person. I never want to be like that. And was fearful of becoming of crazy. Yeah. What if that happened to me? Right. So again, really worth tracking what may be going on in the client and offering them, you know, possibilities. You know, sometimes people are concerned about this. Sometimes people are concerned about that. It'll either land or it won't. It doesn't throw it out. But if it lands, you've opened up that that avenue of communication. Right. So I love that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The, another one I was going to talk about was, you know, well, uh, I go inside and there's nothing there. And Dick talks about this in IFS Therapy Edition 2, right? Uh, mistaking the, the, the blankness or the emptiness for self, right? This comes up a lot with people that have experienced neglect or profound neglect, because when they do go inside, they were never mirrored, their needs were never met, and there is a sense of nothingness, right? So if a client reports with nothing, that's where it can throw uh, an IFS therapist off, right? Oh, there's nothing, what do I do? Remember, it's always a part that's presenting, right? So can you get curious about the nothingness? Mm, right. Yeah. And uh, the um, strongest example of, of, uh, of that for me, it was a really powerful session. This guy was, you know, there's nothing there. And I go inside. Okay, can you stay with the nothingness? Is it okay to get curious? And a few minutes go by. So holding myself energy, doing some breathing, right? Not rushing this. And then he said at some point, actually, there's something, but it's way, way out in the distance. It's like in outer space. I'm like, okay, good. Would it be okay to come to that something? Would it be okay to come closer to it? And so he was coming closer to it and closer to it and closer to it. The way the part was presenting, get this, the metaphor is amazing. It was an astronaut drifting off further and further and further into space because its line had been cut from the mothership. Oh my gosh. I know. Wow. I know. And then it became, of course, this little kid who was staring at his bedroom wall. Right? Needs not met, not sure if he existed. It was a really powerful session to get to the exile. But the point is, get curious about any presentation, get curious about the nothingness, see where it leads you. I love it. <clears throat> That's so good. Yeah. It was great. It was a great session. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Another piece I wanted to talk about, just switching gears from that, is um, how do we transition to or introduce the model? Right? So if you're transitioning to the model <laughs> the way I did it, and it, it depends on how much you love the model, I guess, but the majority of uh, my students, when they graduate, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is transformative. This is the thing. So what I encourage them to do is to say to their established clients, especially the ones that, that they already have a great relationship with, the ones that already love them and vice versa, right? Hey, I've learned this new way of working. I'm a little new at it right now, but you know what? I think it's going to be really helpful to you. And I think it's going to meet your needs in a way that the way you've been working previously may not. Can we give it a shot? Can we give it 20 minutes of a session, see how it goes? When your clients hear your genuineness, your enthusiasm, your um, desire to be able to help them and serve them in this way, they'll hear the amount of self-energy you have in that. And chances are they're going to be okay with it, right? Don't start with the ones that are heavily managerial, don't trust you, you know, bun too tight. Start with the ones who really already have a good relationship with you, right? And then transition. If you're starting with a brand new client, uh, establish a therapeutic alliance. Right? You don't want them to assume that you're just trying to stick a model on their life, right? That's probably already happened to them before. When I ask my students to raise their hand, if they have ever themselves had a negative experience in therapy, most of the time, every hand goes up. So bear that in mind, right? We've got clients coming in with protectors that are suspicious, especially if they've been in therapy where they've been 
reframed, <laughs> right? Or they've been given advice and then scolded when they don't follow the advice, like all the stuff that happens. I had a client once with really low self-esteem parts and um, she had a psychiatrist before coming to see me. The psychiatrist fell asleep during session. Yeah. So she had to, she didn't know what to do. She nudged him awake and then she apologized for being boring. He accepted her apology. No. Oh yeah. my gosh. It was only the second time that he fell asleep that she decided this wasn't for her. Right. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. So, I think it's so good to realize that, right. That sometimes we forget because we're so used to being in therapy, but we forget how scary and weird yeah. and how, yeah. So I think that's really good to re- to remember that. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I love so, that. I love trying the model with your, with people that you already have a really good relationship with. I love that. Yeah. And then with new folks to give it a couple of sessions. Right? And what I like to do is, uh, and, and feel them out, you know, you feel like you're developing a good rapport with them. Um, and then what I like to do is map their story onto the model. Right. So, you know, Someone's story is, uh, you know, my life's pretty good, but I, um, I'm coming to see you because I exploded at my boss the other day when I got a negative performance review, right? And then my partner said, you know, if you lose this job, you're going to lose me. And that scared me, right? And say, okay, good. You know, so I'll hear that and I'll say maybe session three, session four. But this way of working, which I think is going to help you the most, it's a little, it can sound a little weird when we start off, right? Because we're talking about different parts of us, you know, like, if we were friends and I said, do you want to have lunch on Friday? You might say, part of me does, part of me doesn't, right? Well, yeah, so those parts are real. So we're just going to talk about them right, and get to know them. And here's here's what I'm hearing. So this is where you map, right? Their experience out of the model. You usually get good buy-in. Part of you got mad at your boss, right? And then another part of you got scared you're going to lose your relationship and thought, well, let's go to therapy. So that part saying, let's go to therapy, we call those managers because they like to manage your life, right? And they're really helpful. Right. And they're often connected to parts, like the part that was scared you might lose your partner. Right. Well, we call those exiles. Right. Because they tend to hold like, you know, feelings like that. They're scared or whatever. Is that making sense? Yeah, it's making sense. OK, good. Yeah. So when those exiles, when they come up, there are other parts of us that want to fiercely protect them probably your angry part, right? So I'm guessing when you got a negative performance review, it landed on a party that maybe felt like it wasn't good enough or something, and then your angry part come up. Does that make sense? Something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. Yeah. So, you know, in those angry parts, we call those firefighters because they put out that emotional fire. And then I'll give them the list of firefighters. So without having to disclose to me, they know whatever firefighters they've got that their managers are ashamed of, you know, the porn watching ones, the raging ones, the drinking ones, the drugging ones, the gambling ones, whatever they are. I've just normalized them all. And I've talked about how great they are. Love it. That's the first, so great. first time firefighters have ever heard, ever heard. Yeah. They've been demonized internally and externally. Yeah. And here's some guy saying, yeah, these are great points of view. And explaining it. So, and, and like, sort of like, that makes sense, right? So these, these parts these behaviors wow i just sort of told you well why those parts would make sense those behaviors would make sense and yeah. it builds that rapport like thinking of that connection and that rapport and that safety that we're still doing like we're not we're not throwing out like building the rapport and establishing that relationship and so i think by doing that you're teaching the model you're reframing the presenting problem in the ifs language you're teaching the model and you're building a connection which is so yeah. beautiful yeah. And the nice thing is we're reframing it accurately. Right? It, <laughs> right. Yeah. Does, does this feel, you know, right? Yeah. Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay. We're also telling you know, when we're working, my understanding of this work is that we're, we're either co-creating a self energy field or we're co-creating a willingness to drop into that field. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. So then I'd say to the, the client that I've just introduced the model to, so if that was all we had, you know, bouncing around from your partner, feeling good about itself to the one trying to fix it with therapy to the one getting mad at your boss, if that's all we had, that would just spend our lives right, bouncing around. But thankfully, right, there's more to it than that, right? There's also the understanding here is as you at your core, right? And that you at your core are able to help out these other parts, right? Like, are you getting curious about anything I'm telling you right now? That's great. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? So, so what we do is we bring that curiosity you've got to some of these parts, like the part that 
brought you to therapy, like the one that got mad at your boss, like the one that's worried about losing your partner, right? So how does that sound to you? It's great. There's, there's usually buy-in at that point. And then I'd say something like, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left. Do you want to try it? Do you just want to see what it's like? And then where do you notice that? Start with the managers. It's easiest, right? Where do you notice the one that brought you to therapy and around your body? And then you're off with the IFS protocol. Right? And they've had some success connecting with the manager because that's usually the safest way to go. Um, and then you've got the buy and then you're able to work with the model. And it's very much about, I care about you and I believe this is the best way to serve you in terms of what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think this is an, an intra-psychic model and that is where the healing occurs, right? But the relationship is the context within which that healing can occur. Right? And that's that's what I, that's what the client's then able to take away if you introduce it in that way. Yeah, I love that. It's really beautiful. And I loved introducing it because you're, I think you soft, if you explain it that way, I think you soften like the intellectual parts, maybe you, you've given the intellectual parts a little bit of something so they can yeah. settle down now and then you can do the experience. You can give them the experience of it. Well, yeah, it's funny you should name the intellectual parts because the thinker is also where people get stuck, right? So I do have a, a, a video series called IFS Q&A and it talks about the blended thinker, but let me talk about it since you brought it up. <clears throat> so here, so you know how that presents, right? How do you feel towards that part? Oh, I think it just, you know, needed this, right? It's like, okay, that sounds like your thinking part. Would it be willing to soften back? Sure, great. How do you feel towards that one now? Well, I think if the other people around it hadn't done that yet, sounds like your thinking part it's having a hard time pulling back. Could we ask it to pull back again? Sure, great. Okay, let's come back to that little one. How do you feel towards it now? Well, I think if you'd been taught, yeah, okay, you know, three strikes, you're out. Okay, let's come to that thinking part, but without any kind of uh, blaming or shaming, right? It's like, it sounds like it's hard for your thinking part to pull back. It sounds like it's used to doing all the work. Yeah, so how about good. if we get to, yeah, how about if we get to know it, right? Because yeah. it's true. It's just yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay. I like sometimes if they, if it's not clear, like if it's not clear, if I'm, I'm not sure if it's a thinking part or not, it's not like a, I think da, 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 da. I'll some, I'll ask like, where do you notice that from? And they'll often notice it from their head. And then I'm like, okay, that's your thinking. Then, then why know it's your thinking part? Cause you can kind of feel it. And you're like, okay, if it doesn't sound like a clear like yeah. self, and you're not really sure if it's a part, you can ask, you know, where is that coming from? And then it'll be um, a, a thinking part. Yeah. And, and that so will get you stuck. Like you will get stuck and you will not be able to get to the exile and you will not get, something will get in your way. And I think that's yeah. usually what it is. So that's also, you know, you experience being stuck if you're on an exile hunt, but if you drop that, right? Because, the, you know, the protective system is your greatest ally. They determine what's safe. They determine if you're safe, they determine if the client's self is safe. And yeah. but other, the other discernment here is sometimes it's a figuring it out part. And those ones I love, because I'll just say, would you figuring it out part be willing to come back at the end of the session because it'll have more data to play with, right? And they love that, right? That's good. So, yeah, that's really good. But the thinker, if you've got the blended thinker and, and you've got something like, well, this is just me, right? I mean, of mm -hmm. course they think, you know, how could you survive if you didn't think? I might go to direct access, right? So, okay, it's great that you, how long has thinking been important to you? Do you think, well, my whole life, yeah. What are your earliest memories of when thinking was really helpful to you? Right? And when I worked with my thinking part, Bless his, bless his heart. He's uh, five, five and a half. He's in school. They've got the um, cardboard shoe and they've got a lace. Who can tie their lace? Who can figure out how to tie their lace first? Mm -hmm. This thinking part did it before anybody else shot his little hand up, right? Was so <laughs> excited. It's like, okay, good. You know, so tell, tell me more, right? So then when he was 11, uh, the teacher brought in an, one of those old weigh scales you used to see in the old groceries. I don't know if you're old enough to remember those. Um, and a sheaf of paper, right? And it's like, uh, okay, we've got 50 pieces of paper here and this weigh scale. How can we figure out one piece of paper's weight? My thinking part sat there, his little tongue came out, thinking real hard. And then it was like his head exploded. It's like, oh. You could weigh 50 pieces, then divide it by 50 to get, and his head just like, this was a, uh, this was a paradigm shift in his little consciousness, right? So the more he's telling me about what he loves about himself, the more I'm able to love him up for all of that. 
And when that's happening in the client system, when they've got a blended thing, you know, this is me, I figure stuff out, I've always been around, this is who I am. On the inside, suddenly this part that this is who I am, this is just who I am, feels or hears someone saying, I appreciate you. And because it's smart, it's going to go, wait a second, where is that coming from? And then you're going to have much more success with it unblending enough to be appreciated. I love that. And then you want it on board, right? Because the thing about the thinkers is they generate hypotheses, right? Mm. Why did you do that? Well, I think I did that because. Mm -hmm. So we can say to it, you know what? You might be right. You might be right. Let's test out your hypotheses by asking the part directly. Yeah, great. And if it's right, we can say you were right on. Thanks so much for that. And if it's not right, it's like, hey, that helped us hone in on it and find out exactly what's going on. So thank you for that. And they're incredible allies. The thinking parts are incredible allies. Once they know that they're loved, respected, and appreciated, and that self exists. But if they don't know that, no way they're going to give up the reins. Why should they? That it's not safe to do that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Love it. Thinkers. Well, I love how you get to think or as an ally, right? By and unblend it by saying, like, you don't ask for it for space necessarily, but you're like, oh, good hypothesis. Let's like, let's together check with the part. And yeah. then the thinker becomes like such a good ally. And then yeah. you get unblended from the thinker and both unblended from the other part. Yeah. Yeah. All the, I mean, that's all of the protectors are allies, right? So if you're working, yeah, for example, great. and you've got, you've got the blanking out part, right? Would it be okay to get to know, let's say there's an exile, be okay to get to know, them. I've just gone blank. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so let's thank that blanking out part. Let's let it know we're not going to go past it. That would be foolish because it's one of your protectors. I'm really glad it's here. Yeah. Would it be willing to let you know more directly what its concern is? And it's usually overwhelm or one of the common concerns, right? It's like, great, thank you for letting us know that. Um, Now that we know there's a concern about overwhelm, here's what we're going to do. We're going to let that exile know that the best way for it to be heard, which is what it wants, is to present the information less intensely. So we're helping it to be heard, which is what it wants, by giving it that information. And then, instead of the blanking out part, I wonder if your blanking out part would be willing to kind of sit on the sidelines. And if it looks like you're going to get overwhelmed, jump in and blank everything out again, because it's really good at that. And once it's got, it's got the power anyway, but once it knows that we appreciate it having that power, um, it relaxes. It's great. And it often will, it'll dance in and out. You get some Excel information and then blank out. Good, because the rest of the system needs to accommodate what it just heard from the Excel and then dance in and out again. Love it. That's great. That's great. All right. What's another stuck point? So good. Oh, I don't know. Do you have one that comes up for you or one you've heard? Did who well, did we go cover your list? We did. Oh my goodness, look at us. I love it. Rock. <laughs> we do rock. Oh, oh you know I... what we were gonna do? We were gonna do the how are you. So let me tell you something that um, <laughs> I'm I'm so thrilled about. Last week, I was teaching the um, Foundations of IFS Therapy course through the Adler uh, Institute, invited somebody to do a demo. And um, to my surprise, especially in a Foundations course, a guide came through and facilitated the healing. So So I said to her afterwards, I said, I've got three parts up. One part would like to um, ask you permission to be able to use this in my advanced teaching. Another part's aware that we're in a power dynamic, we're a teacher-student power dynamic, and wants to name that. And then a third part says, you're a grown woman and you can make these decisions for yourself. So (laughs) how is it to hear that? She laughed and she said, of course, I could see how this would be valuable. Of course, you can use it. So now in the advanced weekend that I teach, where we look at guides and unattached burdens and legacy burdens and and Locke Kelly's work on more self, um, there's now, an example of how a guide heals. And it was remarkable. That's amazing. Um, So two questions about that. One, can you tell us how you knew it was a guide? Like, how did you know, how did you know to either ask for a guide or how you knew it was a guide? Yeah. So about halfway through the session and um, just want to check. I don't give too much identifying information. No, we're good. So a a two-year-old 
uh, in a hospital room, a number of procedures, right? And uh, very frightened, looking at the door always to see if the doctor or nurse was gonna come in to do yet another procedure. And suddenly there's a comforting arm or hand on the arm of the, of the infant. The way the session had gone, it was it felt like that wasn't wasn't how a system would typically present. So I just asked, that comforting hand, does that feel like a, a guide or does it feel like another part? Because right? I'm always alert to comforting, slightly different presentation. She said, well, it's just an arm. I said, no, I get that. Um, and could you ask if it, if it belongs to a guide or if it's another part's arm? And she said, well, it, said it feels like it might be a guide. So this guide came in to provide a comfort to that infant. And then a little later, so we retrieved the infant um, into the client's heart. The infant took her first steps in the client's heart. It was so moving. I was just really needing to focus so I didn't cry. It was so beautiful. Um, and there had been a part that was worried about being excited. Well, the worry became clear. If you get excited and you can't walk, you're going to fall over. So would it be okay to let that excited part be present? No. Okay, good to know. So how come something needs to happen in my back first? Okay, do you know what that is? Um, no, but now three women have come in to work on my back. Mm. So um, of course I sat back, which is what you do when guides come in, right? And just give the session over to them. And I don't know what the healing is or was in her back. I don't need to, I just wow. don't need to. I'm just trusting that these, presences that have come in are doing the healing work on this woman's back. And uh, oh, so I just sat, of course, in awe, but it was also in the context of, uh, it was a demo in a, in a teaching environment. So I said, um, two parts up, one that wants this to run its complete course and the other part that's aware of this, well, this woman laughed and she said, of course you can go back to the students. I'm just sitting here with these women as they're healing my back. I'm like, good, stay with that. Amazing. Then we'll come to the students. You know, it was fascinating. So of course, these are brand new to IFS, some of them students. So uh, questions about the demo, because I knew it was an unusual demo. It seems to me that some people's systems did not allow them to see what had just happened. Really? I, I think their protectors were just like, I have no way of understanding that. So I'm gonna focus in on some, because they were asking questions like, so right at the beginning, when you said, uh, that we should go here instead of there. And I thought, that's what your parts are asking questions about. And what just happened was a healing from uh, an entity that came into the system. And you've got no framework for it. It was so interesting, interesting. how protectors really protect us, right? Like, yeah. that's just too, too challenging. Yeah. Or the, what's coming up for me is the, the I want to learn the model so much. Cause I remember being like this where I'm like, like, okay, you said this exact phrase. Why did you say this phrase and not this <laughs> phrase? You know what I mean? So I think that like when you're first learning the model, I could also see how parts are like so focused on that stuff and then probably couldn't even track what else was happening. Yeah. Right. I'm just focusing on like you said this and then this and yeah. 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 No, I think you're, I think you're probably right. I, and I was just I was just struck by because I was just, whoa, what just happened? You know, yeah. like whenever guides come into work, there never seems to be any rhyme or reason to it. You know, just but when they appear, I'm just so grateful and so in awe. It's like there's yeah. something so much bigger here, mm. so much bigger than you know the, than a, a psychology model. I'm so grateful to Dick for bringing us these teachings, right, and for. Mm -hmm inviting us to just be in a space where we can co-create that environment where these phenomena can occur. Mm. Yeah, what an amazing honor we have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Derek, do you want to say, just sort of tell everybody your website, tell everybody you have a, so many cool things happening. Anything you want to say or you want to just direct people to your website? Uh, well, the master classes actually. So I have I host a master class every month. Um, so we're in January. So coming up, I've got Liz Phillips on relationships. Uh, Liz is amazing. Who you well. know, I love. Uh huh. What's well, not to love? Plus, so it's much. Not about, it's not about like doing 
cuts work, right? She, she articulates the dynamics of relationships. So, I mean, as you know, so many of our clients wish their partners knew that they had parts as well, right? Because it's like, it's, it's like a one-way mirror. So like, I can see my parts, I can see your parts. Right? <laughs> and so how do you navigate that? Because it can be challenging. Once you know that the system's multiple, you know your partner system is multiple, but they don't. Yeah. So just understanding some of those dynamics, I think is really helpful just to, for all of us. Um, and then in February, I've got Mike Elkin and Ann Sinko there working on uh, anxiety, depression, and shame, the relationship between all of those. That's one of their level twos. I love mm-hmm. that. Yep. And then in March, no, April, February, much April, Christine Dennis, you're going to want to come to this. She's a medical herbalist. She's been working for 25 years in the field, IFS practitioner. And this is um, Birthing the Wise Woman. The journey through menopause. So, she's so ten- wait a minute. Wait a yeah. minute. Why are you yeah. saying that I need to come to that? So that you can help all those women that are much older than you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just <laughs> so what she's done, this is brilliant. She's identified that when you come to the hormones and you ask them about their role, because they're parts, and you ask them how they're doing now, right? Because the estrogen can't, you know, push the good mother thing as much as it used to. And how is the progesterone with the changes? And what's happening to the follicle stimulating hormone? When you ask them as parts, and they let you know, it becomes possible to navigate, right? Through perimenopause, all the way through to menopause, and then to emerge at the other end as the wise woman, right? But it's a stormy road. Amazing. Yeah, I I want want all of her information. I love come. that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so my website. Plus, you know, so much for me of IFS seems to be very male focused. So to be able to yeah. offer this just just feels incredible. Huge. And then in May, I've got Nick Roos, who's uh, talking about IFS and psychedelics. And, you know, no matter how you feel about psychedelics, clients are beginning to use them recreationally and in other ways. So he's a really smart guy. He understands the effect on the brain. He, under, you know, he's, he's part of the MAPS phase three clinical trial. He's a certified IFS therapist. He's brilliant. So I'm looking forward to hosting him. And then, oh, the advanced weekends, which uh, anybody who's L1 grad is welcome to come to. I think there's one in May, Um, four day intensives in May and in June. And then in September, we start the whole stepping stone thing again, Um, which now, uh, once you've graduated that, you can move straight onto the Adler Broader broader applications of IFS. I've just finished teaching that IFS with pain and then IFS with trauma. Mm. And um, so Francois Ladoz, do you know Francois? Have you ever no, met but him? you and I talked about that. Yeah, go oh. ahead. You talked about sorry, this. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So Francois's work, he's integrated attachment theory with polyvagal theory and IFS. And if you come to um, a part zero to three, that's where the attachment trauma occurs, right? But it presents as a state, doesn't, doesn't feel or sound like a part, it's just sort of vague, fuzzy, I'm frightened. He moves into polyvagal co-regulation because he identifies that the client system is not safe, facilitates safety, come back using the IFS work. So his integration of polyvagal with IFS is facilitating access to parts and attachment trauma that may not otherwise be accessible. Amazing. That's amazing. And, well, what excites me about it, where I believe we're going, where the field is going, next 5, 10, 20 years is increasingly we're going to have to address um, climate collapse and survival trauma. Mm-hmm. Right? And attachment trauma is survival trauma. And I think our inability to go there is why we're doing like business as usual in the face of the catastrophe. Right? So I think if we can find ways to go there, and I think Francois's work helps us to do that, um, and we clear that early attachment trauma, we may be available to look at what's going on and get out of our kind of cultural paralysis and start to do something around climate. Because I did a lot of research on climate this year. I had to back away from it periodically. I was so triggered. There's a study from the University of Bath, 10,000 youth, 16 to 24, 11 countries. 56% of those youth agreed with the statement humanity is doomed. Wow. Yeah. So somehow our young people are holding that mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. where should I take, take my career? Right? Somehow they're able to hold both, but mm-hmm. those either are our clients or they're going to be our clients in five and 10 years time. And I believe we need to do our own work around it so we can attend to them because in another study, 
Um, the older the therapists, more likely they are to say to the young people, yeah, what's your climate anxiety really about? Yeah. yeah. I've got all that going on. <laughs> not that's not that, that much. Yeah. So you have, to, you have time. You have time for other things like your dogs oh, and yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for this. I'm excited to put this out in the world. And I always love talking to you. Me too. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time.